Good morning, everyone. And just take a moment to just rejoice on just what has happened just here in that awesome moment of worship that our worship team just provided for us. Let's make a joyful noise. Let us see all of the applause goes to God. God is working through that team this morning. The Spirit of God is here. We welcome you, Spirit. For those of you who don't know me, my name is Sean. I'm the campus pastor here at uh, Center Point. If you want to open your Bibles to uh, Colossians chapter 2, we're in the first seven verses, but also I'll be referencing the last verses of the previous chapter, at the end of chapter 1, for all you note-takers out there, and uh, if you want to be able to reflect on the sermon later in these texts, will be in the, the end of Acts chapter 7 into the beginning of chapter 8, I'll also be tap touching in chapter 9 as well, so I'll just get into the announcements, I've got a lot to get to here. I thank you all for praying for me as I, I had COVID and appreciate the prayers. It's been wonderful. I prepared this message during the, the heart of when I had COVID, so I was a little bit delirious. We're going to see how this goes. <laughs> this is the COVID message. So I'm pretty shocked what was documented here, so we're going to see how this goes. <laughs> Tomorrow at 12 p.m., uh, Chester and Ginger are hosting a potluck lunch at their place and a Bible study and all are welcome and invited. The address should be behind me right here. They live in Mertonvale and uh, they have a, they're wonderful Christians and they have a welcoming, loving home, very hospitable. It's, uh, it's, it's an amazing time at their house. I was a great laugh with Chester, so come on now. He'll make you laugh. Did you say at or with? <laughs> with, with Chester. Sorry. <laughs> it's hard to believe in in less than two weeks now, our team is headed back to Puerto Rico yeah. to serve along four other churches. We're taking up a, a special offering so that we can have some extra funds to uh, be able to do some ministry down there and help some people while we're down there. So if you'd like to, to give uh, to that, that, that love fund, we're calling it, uh, give at centerpointchurch.ca. And we just ask that you make the password. Global Missions, if you'd like to donate to that specifically. And there's also, if you'd like to give to the church in general, there's a basket downstairs on the table. And you can also e-transfer us at give at centerpointchurch.ca and make that um, password center point. Last day, our connect groups are back up and running. And we have them here at the building on Tuesdays at 6 p.m. here in Montague. Um, in Summerside, they're at 7 p.m. Tuesdays. Wednesday at uh, town at 7 p.m. You can visit our website also to see, if, uh, see what, what the time zones are all at. This Friday, we're gonna have a Hear From Heaven event as well. That's gonna be uh, Friday, October 28th at 7 p.m. It's a night of worship and prayer. It's a wonderful time if you'd like to come out and pray with us, worship with us. We're gonna be doing that this Friday. So I'll pray and we'll get into the, the text. Uh, first, I will dismiss our children. If there's any to be dismissed, go ahead. And you can go back there now. Heavenly Father, I pray that these words that are spoken, especially from your scripture as they're alive, as your actual living word, the teachings from the oracles of God. I pray that these reach your hearts well and they, and they, they adjust you and they strengthen you as you go out week to week that the words that I speak are just mere words from a human being, but the words from God are words from God. I see Alpha. I'm just a tiny, tiny little beta. So God, I pray that this reaches you well in your spirits. In the name of our Lord Jesus, I pray this. Amen. Amen. For I want you to know how great a struggle I have for you, and for those at Laodicea, and for all who have not seen me face to face, that their hearts may be encouraged, being knit together in love, to reach all the riches of full assurance of understanding and the knowledge of God's mystery, which is Christ, in Him, in whom are all are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. I say this in order that no one may delude you with plausible arguments. For though I am absent in body, yet I am with you in spirit, rejoicing to see your good order and the firmness of your faith in Christ. Therefore, as you received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in him, rooted and built up in him, and established in the faith, just as you were taught, abounding in thanksgiving. In verse 1, we get to see Paul's pastoral heart, his willingness to struggle for his fellow Christians, 
He also mentions being absent from them. So he's not gathered with him, but he writes to them. It's been great for us gathering together these past few weeks as both campuses have come together. And it's also been great getting to preach different weeks with Pastor Howie as I get to deliver the message, but also I get to receive the message as well. It's been amazing. During the delivery of a message or a sermon, there's something profound that happens from the front of the room, at least from my own experience. I heard other pastors say something similar. During the outward proclamation expressed, there's a, a stirring, a welling up, a moment that the soul, when the proclamation is given of the Lord Jesus, everything else that is spoken from us as preachers is merely commentary. And that doesn't diminish the stories told and the banter at all. They are all useful and they will be used by God. We are all called to preach. The word in Greek is euangelizo, a word frequently used to preach in the New Testament. It's one of the most dominant words, actually. It's used 54 times in the New Testament. We are all called to preach euangelizo, the gospel, the euangelion. The word for gospel. The good news of Jesus Christ. In Romans chapter 1 verse 15 says, How beautiful are the feet of those who preach the good news. So there is an equipping the gospel gives, which results in a willingness and a readiness to go out, to go. This equipment is seen in Ephesians chapter 6 as part of the armor we have as soldiers. The shoes of our feet provide us with a readiness that's given by the gospel of peace. Also in Ephesians chapter 6, Paul asks for prayer. That words may be given to him, opening his mouth boldly to proclaim the mystery of the gospel. The words may be given to him in opening his mouth boldly to proclaim to him, to which Paul says he is an ambassador in chains. This points toward the fact that Paul is in service as a slave to the gospel of Jesus Christ which we all are. There's another way to look at these chains in regards to sin. The chains are broken and we are set free and through the readiness to share with other captives how it is this, we receive this freedom, we rush up to them with the chains hanging off of us to say, look what Jesus has done. My chains are broken. There's another interesting word in Greek also in the New Testament translated for preaching. It's only used 18 times, katangelo. And this word has a celebration attached to its meaning. Of the 18 times that it's used in the New Testament, 11 of them are used throughout the book of Acts of the Apostles, which of course records the day of Pentecost and the rushing of the Holy Spirit and the beginning of the New Testament church. Talk about a celebration. So as we rush up to people with our proclamation, bound in chains to the gospel, we also approach with broken chains hanging off of us from our freedom from sin. We rush up onto people filled with a celebratory cry. There's a level of excitement that comes from the freedom as we go out. I was a lifeguard facing the head in my early 20s. And there was an ice cream shop down near the beach, it was called The Scoop. Some of you may be familiar with it if you've been to Basin Head. It's been there for years. Needless to say, I ate a lot of ice cream during those summers. I was sitting on the lifeguard chair during this one hot particular day, and someone came running up to me, and all out of breath said what I'll never forget. The freezer that keeps all of the ice cream cool at the ice cream shop is broken, and we need someone to eat all of the ice cream because it's starting to melt. So like a superhero, I sprang up into action. This definitely sounds like a job for me. This news was good. It was good news to my 21-year-old self. And in sharing the news to others, I was excited to tell others, free ice cream, eat all you can. I was like Oprah Winfrey running down the beach. You get ice cream, you get an ice cream, you get an ice cream. Little did I know, 20 years later, I'd be sharing the news of a much different kind. We are all called to share this news of Jesus. But do we share it? And how do we share it? The news which we share is the freedom from the curse of sin 
and eternity spent with God in the new kingdom. That's cause for celebration, amen? amen? We don't stumble up to people all mumbly, like we're inviting them to our fifth grade birthday party. Hey, so I wanted to invite you to my birthday party. There's going to be balloons. There's going to be maybe a clown, cake. Jeff's going to be there. You like Jeff. <laughs> this is not elementary school. We don't write a note that says, will you accept the gospel of Jesus? Click the box, yes or no. This is the proclamation that Jesus suffered and died on the cross for the forgiveness of our sins because he loves us so much. He's now risen from the dead as Lord and is with his Father in heaven on the throne. That gets spoken boldly and expressed with passion, with fervor, and with urgency. And for that reason, get ready for the struggle. Get ready for suffering to come. Because there will be a pushback against such a proclamation of preaching from us. The greater the proclamation, the greater the condemnation from enemy forces. There is yet another Greek word used for reclaiming and preaching in the New Testament. It's actually used the most amount of times. 61 times. And that's keruso. It's the Greek word most frequent to describe what flows out of Jesus during his proclamation as the source. As the king speaks of his own presence in reference to people, it's a preacher holding an office as a herald who relays a message from the king. In reference to people, but also... It's someone who teaches doctrine and demands obedience with a warning of consequence, who preaches in front of a public or in front of a group. This is the main function of the office of the pastorate as an overseer to help you distinguish some of the differences in preaching. Think of a, think of a professor who teaches a class and gives a lecture. Now, if the dean of a university were to tell the professor of a class, all of your students are failing your class, but since they work so hard, we're going to actually give them an A plus for this class. Now the professor, he represents the Caruso, the proclaimer or preacher, holding an office of authority, having the ability to teach and warn of disobedience, preaching to a group, the class. You are failing this class, but since you have all worked so hard, the dean has decided to give you an A plus for this class. That would get met with a celebration. Enjoy by all students who heard that. The students who heard would be compelled to tell other students who didn't hear. We, we are all failing this class, but the dean has granted us an A plus for everyone. And as each student hears the good news cheerfully, it keeps getting passed along. The student preaches the truth with received joy and celebration. That's Catherine Gallo. Jesus is responsible to proclaim his self in the coming of his own kingdom. Preachers are responsible to relay that message with authority and in truth. And everyone is called to preach and proclaim as a celebration with joy. We are all called to preach and proclaim the gospel. Like I said, anyone who preaches the gospel will face struggles and adversity. If I speak the words transgender, LGBT. I teach on sex and sexuality, it gets flagged, and I'm expected to submit to the world's doctrine and their agenda to proclaim and teach what the world believes to be truth. Well, I will not submit to that. Amen. Polycarp, the Bishop of Rome, the Bishop of Smyrna, sorry, not the Bishop of Rome, the Bishop of Smyrna challenged Rome and spoke with the truth of the gospel which ran counter to a pagan culture believing in polytheism. Because of this, Bishop Polycarp was dragged to a stake and tied to be burned. Polycarp told them this, and this is one of my favorite things. Polycarp told them to keep their nails and not to waste them. It's a recorded a document, early historian. Told them to keep their nails because they wouldn't need them to fasten him to the spike because God was going to strengthen him to endure these flames. That's what Polycarp told him while he was being dragged to a spike to be burned. He was willing to struggle for the gospel as an overseer. When God's word gets spoken and read, our souls are nourished with living water. 
Polycarp's soul was nourished with that living water, and he endured. And that nourishment feeds our faith and our spirits. I take a lot of photos. So sometimes someone asks me, how do I take better photos? And I tell them, take more photos. Take lots of photos. And if they ask me, what's the best camera to take those photos? I always say, the one that's in your hand. <laughs> it's the same with uh, learning about God. If you want to, how do I learn more about God? Read about God in your Bible. And what's the best Bible to read? The one that's in your hand, honestly. Because you can get so caught up in the whys and the hows. It's the doing that gets lost amongst them. Once you start reading what's in your hand, you'll then advance, and then you'll find the right translation for you. I'm not here to debate different translations, but go start with the one that's in your hand. The Bible is a document of the Spirit, which was written by people of the Spirit, and received by people of the Spirit, then protected, sorted, and canonized, by people of the Spirit. From the first stroke of writing on the first papyrus sheet to the moment you opened your Bible and read the first word, the Spirit of God moved to get those words in front of your eyeballs. The early Christians were under heavy persecution and paid with their blood to preserve those sacred writings. The very least we can do to honor that legacy is actually read our Bibles. Because the Spirit can well up inside of you too within its pages to teach us, to conform us, to transform us, to mold us. This is what we as Christians should want for each other, yeah? Mm -hmm. To encourage each other to be built up in our faith for Jesus. There is a longing that should ache within us for this. The Apostle Paul frequently ached for the Christians in Asia Minor. And now we get to see Paul's pastoral heart even more and more vividly here. He longed to be in person with Christians. Verse 5 of our verses today say that. For though I am absent in body, yet I am with you in spirit, rejoicing to see your good order and the firmness of your faith in Christ. He encourages them in verse 2 to also be encouraged as they are knit together in love. There is a oneness, a unity of the church that is preached all through the New Testament. We gather together as a body of believers. And the reason we gather is because Jesus first gathered us. Jesus is the one who gathers. And Jesus says that he is the door of the sheep. And the sheep hear his voice. And he calls his own sheep by name. We hear and we are gathered. You're here today as we are gathered from a position of strength. Not on your own strength, but the strength that was given to you. It is from this position of strength that we have the ability to bear each other's burdens, each one of us here, so that we can grow in faith and in our relationship with Jesus. As my faith deepened, I realized that Jesus never stops wanting more from us and from us because he never stops giving of himself. Jesus is a gift. We never stop receiving what he has gifted to us. You may remember having a Christmas stocking as a kid. You'd be pulling up lifesaver candies and trinkets and that weird orange chocolate thing that you got to smash down to open it. And it seems like your stocking just is endless. It goes on forever. As a kid, it just seems like it goes forever. But the gift of Jesus actually does go on forever. He gives of himself endlessly. The problem isn't that there are limits within what Jesus gives. The problem is that we set limitations within ourselves. Some haven't received the gift of Jesus in faith. If that's you, I'm asking you, please accept the gift of Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. Because through Him, your sins are forgiven. And then there are those who have received Jesus, but get sometimes stuck to figure out what exactly they received. And I think we've all maybe been there. I know I have. You open up a present, you look at it and you first say, man, this is awesome. And then you ask, what is it? <laughs> How do you know it's awesome if you don't know what it is? But you just immediately go to, oh, I want to be polite. I'm Canadian. This is awesome. <laughs> I don't know what it is, though. My father, my father always shakes every single gift he receives. Christmas, birthday. He always wants to know what's inside of it to figure it out. It can be easy to get frustrated because we don't understand the gift that's been given to us. As I mentioned a few weeks ago, 
We can be so small-minded when it comes to the magnitude of God, which is so beyond what we can comprehend. This is also true for the sacrifice Jesus has made for us. So we go to the source for the answers. Who is God? We go to His Word. And if we can focus on the joys and the beauty of what has been given to us, the grace and love God shows us, we can truly be at peace within chaos. Jesus gave the ultimate gift of His life to us. And inside that gift are the endless treasures of the next verses. As we keep moving along in this series, which is all about Jesus, we enter into a new chapter, now chapter 2, verses 1 to 7. And Paul is going to continue to reveal his pastoral heart. So let's reflect on this for a moment, because it's a miracle that Paul has a pastoral heart at all. Paul heavily persecuted the early Christians as the higher arm of the Pharisees, as a Pharisee, to hunt Christians. Have you ever researched it out and really felt that in living color and really allowed yourself to picture what this means that Paul hunted Christians? Let's have a look at a verse uh, from the book of Acts, chapter 9, right at the beginning. But Saul, so this is talking about Paul, prior to his conversion, before he was a Christian himself, he was known, he was known as Saul, still breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord, went to the high priest and asked him for letters to the synagogues at Damascus, so that he, if he found any belonging to the way, men or women, he might bring them bound to Jerusalem. So here Paul is asking for letters from the high priest of the synagogues for the purpose of gaining intel. That's what he wanted. After receiving the intel, he was off to Damascus to hunt for Christians in that location, making Paul a hired bounty hunter and an assassin and instead of it being illegal, which is what all assassinations are now, it was fully lawful for him to carry out that act. Paul inflicted such absolute suffering on the early Christians that maybe only Emperor Nero or Diocletian could match that level of persecution. The end of chapter 7 of Acts leading into chapter 8 reads, And as they were stoning Stephen, he called out, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. And falling to his knees, he cried out with a loud voice, Lord, do not hold this sin against them. And when he had said this, he fell asleep. And Saul approved of his execution. And there arose on that day a great persecution against the church in Jerusalem. And they were all scattered throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria, except the apostles. Devo men buried Stephen and made great lamentation over them. But Saul was ravaging the church. And entering house after house, he dragged off men and women and committed them to prison. Paul inflicted a lot of suffering on the early Christians. What were the early Christians to do? Who could possibly help them? Then comes Jesus and presents himself as a magnificent light to Paul on the road to Damascus. Why, Paul? Why are you persecuting me? Because if you persecute the children of Jesus who make up his body, which is the church, you persecute Jesus directly. Not indirectly, not symbolically, not metaphorically, not metaphysically, not philosophically. Jesus is being persecuted literally and directly. And for that reason, a flash of light emits from Jesus which blinds Paul, which forever changes Paul from a man who inflicts suffering on Christ's children to a man who now suffers for Christ's children for the specific purpose of advancing the gospel to the Gentiles and suffering for the gospel. The gospel being the good news of Jesus Christ. The entire rest of Paul's ministry would be marked by his willingness to suffer for the sake of the gospel, which was used to build up Christ's church. And it forces us to ask ourselves a pretty important question. Am I willing to suffer for the sake of the gospel? So if you have your Bibles open to chapter 2, verse 1, just look backwards a little bit. Or you can look at the screen behind me. This is an important one. It matters to what is going on in the beginning of chapter 2. So chapter 1, verse 24. Now I rejoice in my suffering for your sake. Have a look at the person beside you, behind you, 
in front of me. Look around the congregation. Could you say to any one of those people, I'm willing to suffer for your sake? Could you say to any one of those people, not only am I willing to suffer for your sake, but also rejoice in my suffering for you? Look at me. Direct that question at me. Pastor, are you willing to suffer for our sakes and our behalf and rejoice in that? Because I am held to that standard. All pastors are. And when I think about that standard, full transparency, it has terrified me. So if you too doubt yourself, wonder if you could, and are terrified at the thought, I am happy to relate to what you're saying. So what in the world does that mean for us? Well, it means something slightly different for us as pastors, as we are called into a deeper affliction. Which is why when people mention wanting to become pastors, I just feel like karate chopping them in the neck. Just one day, chop! And then ask them. They ask, what is that for? Well, that's your first lesson. <laughs> Get used to pain. Are you ready to rejoice in more? The rest of the verse provides the info we need to answer that question and relate it to our lives now. And in my flesh, I am filling up what is lacking in Christ's afflictions for the sake of his body, that is, the church, of which I became a minister according to the stewardship from God that was given to me for you. To make the word of God fully known. The mystery hidden for ages and generations. But now revealed to his saints. Okay, right off the bat. Some people stumble hearing the word lacking in Christ's afflictions. As if there is something lacking within Christ. Impossible. I think that is maybe more of an emotional response. Paul had just finished at the beginning of chapter 1. Describing the essence of Jesus as God who lacks nothing. This verse is not saying that Jesus' afflictions are lacking. Rather, what is in Jesus' afflictions is what is lacking, which is us. We are reconciled to God through the afflictions of Jesus, his broken body and blood spilled. We go from death to life. Growth within us comes when we have a deeper relationship with Jesus. We do that by loving him and serving others deeper. We do that by being self-sacrificial and willing to struggle for, for others. Then and only then can we say we are filling up what is lacking within Christ's afflictions. That is why when Jesus works through Paul by the power of the Spirit, and Paul is able to toil and struggle for the church and rejoices in his suffering, Paul is being built up, and he builds up the church as well. As Paul builds up the church, He's filling what is lacking in Christ's afflictions. Paul suffers to further encourage the saints and spread the gospel. This is growth through suffering. It's saying, it says it's for the sake of his body, the church. Struggling for the sake of the church is, for the church is going to look differently from person to person. But it must be present in our lives. It has to be. This doesn't mean we need to be shipwrecked or beaten half to death or imprisoned to suffer for the gospel. So we can tell I'll take a big sigh of relief there. So how do we suffer well for the sake of others? One way is to deny ourselves and the passions of our flesh and use the gifts that God has given us to serve. So often we are unwilling to be uncomfortable so others may grow as our spiritual gift is being used. A pastor who has the gift of wisdom and never shares his wisdom simply because he has no interest in, in teaching would be doing others a disservice. A pastor who has the gift of preaching who never spoke, maybe because he was too nervous, likewise is not serving well for the sake of others. Let's say your spiritual gift is defending the faith and you're called to debate others, but you fear the shame of the backlash and the mob, so you silence yourself. You're not struggling for the sake of your brothers and sisters well. If you have the gift of prayer and you help feed others through your gift of prayer and your church needs someone to lead a group on Thursday night and your Thursday nights are free but you'd rather sit at home in your PJs, pick lint out of your belly button, you're not struggling for the sake of your brothers and your sisters, well, this gave you a visual. <laughs> the desires of our flesh will run counter to our gifts. And make no mistake, the first voice in your ear 
will be Satan saying, you shouldn't have to suffer for anyone, for any reason. He'll be the one saying, it's okay, stay in your PJs. You had such a long day. Someone else will lead that group. And then every group going forward, you deserve, you deserve to rest permanently. And so often, we listen to the lies and the excuses because our flesh does not want to suffer for anyone. Let no one tell you that you won't struggle or suffer as a Christian. It's not true. Not only will you struggle, you should struggle. When someone says, I do that, but it's so hard for me, it's just so difficult, I want to say, good! That's not the politically correct answer in this day and age, but it is the biblical answer. It's what we all need to hear. It's what I need to hear, that's for certain. I'm not unincluded from this at all. Romans 5 teaches us that suffering produces perseverance. And at the very beginning of James, he teaches us to consider it pure joy. Pure joy when we face trials of many kinds. The testing of your faith produces perseverance. Are you filled with joy when you face a trial? Sometimes we don't even want to roll out of bed to go to church. Let's be real. When we are met with a struggle and succumb to that struggle by running or hiding or complaining, we cut our ability to persevere and grow off at the knees because true integrity of the spirit is built up to the denial of oneself and the willingness to serve, especially when it is painful. Jesus served when it was painful for him. He suffered physical, emotional, spiritual, and mental anguish. Now that doesn't mean you have to accomplish all things. You don't need to run out and sign up for every ministry imaginable. We need to be focused on our own spiritual gifts, but also respecting the gifts of others. To not judge each other or measure each other's contributions by our gifts. So if you read your Bible all day long, and someone reads it only once a week, don't give them a hard time for that. Maybe they pray all throughout the day, and you pray only once a week. How great a struggle I have for you, Paul says. Don't you all want to be have a true test of strength? Pushing forward in the face of actual adversity? Isn't that where true strength lies? Sometimes we puff up our chests and pretend to be so tough. But suffering willingly and joyfully, that is strength. Staying in the mess to reconcile with one another instead of walking away, that is strength. Having hard conversations instead of ignoring them, that is strength. Facing adversity instead of hiding from it is strength. Owning our faults and being humble is strength, not the other way around. Think about this. There were men who got escorted onto a beach in Normandy by boat, World War II. I don't teach that in schools that much anymore, I don't think. And they were greeted by enemy fire before the doors even opened. They knew they were rushing into possible death, sometimes certain death. They were about to face adversity. But they went anyway. They were trained for this. Soldiers are taught how to stay calm facing immediate death without absolutely losing their minds and curling up into the fetal position and crying like an infant. They were prepared for war. They were prepared to be able to face the greatest of adversities because no soldier purposely walks into a war zone unprepared. So let's prepare because adversity is coming regardless if we want it or not. Professed crisis came and you're heading for a whole lot of adversity. The world wants to groom Christians into submission by being repulsed by adversity. But world of comfort is death. For I want you to know how great a struggle I have for you, Paul says. The world is going bananas. We can see this all around us. The devil and his plans are clearer than ever. Let's talk about comfortability. Let's talk about struggling for each other's sake. Let's talk about rejoicing in our sufferings for each other. I was watching the news the other day, and I saw the craziest thing. A true tell sign of the state of our world. They were talking about a company called Oppidum. And this is Latin for underground settlement. This is a doomsday bunker 
that billionaires are currently building under their mansions by the thousands right now. These bunkers can be yours for the low, low, bargain, starting price of $10 million. <coughs> the purpose of these bunkers is not just to avoid threats from natural disasters, viruses, and wars. The main selling point was that these billionaires, they don't have to give up any of their comforts, none of them. They have giant pools under there, saunas, wine cellars, rainfall balls, art exhibits of fine art, in a doomsday bunker, which is meant for survival. What would a tagline be to sell a kind of product like that? Well, it's whatever is happening in the world outside, you can rest easy. And here's the slogan for the company. This is security without sacrifice, comfort without compromise. This is how horrifically fall, horrifically far, the world has fallen from a moral compass and away from God. Imagine, well, I just settled into my $10 million bunker while the world implodes above my head, but I've got my Picasso on the wall, my $3,000 bottle of wine, my silk pajamas, so all's good. I'm good. In a way, I'm glad that these things are out in the open for people to see, because at least we know what we are facing. If you want to spend $10 million to build a sealed bunker under your home to protect your life, by all means do so. But if you're, being, if you're buying a sealed tight bunker to protect your billion dollars and all the comforts and pleasures that money can provide, while millions of people die all around you during a disaster or a nuclear war, because they can't afford a bunker, that's taking it to a whole nother level. This is protection of comfort and pleasure at all costs. Comfort becomes their God. Comfort that the world provides is death. In the book of Acts, early believers and followers of Jesus dispelled all of their comforts and belongings. They didn't hang on to their comforts and worldly passions. Now the full number of those who believed were of one heart and soul. And no one said that any of the things that belonged to him was his own. But they had everything in common. And with great power the apostles were giving their testimony to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. And great grace was upon them all. There was not a needy person among them. For as many as were owners of lands or houses sold them and brought, them, brought the proceeds of what was sold and laid it at the apostles' feet. And it was distributed to each as any had need. The early Christians gave up all of their riches, all of their possessions, all of their comforts, everything that brought them earthly pleasure. They gave it up because their treasure was found in Jesus. Their comfort was found in Jesus. Does this sound compatible at all with the doomsday bunker for billionaires? Someone who spends $10 million on a bunker to protect all of their riches, all of their possessions, all of their comforts, and everything that provides them earthly pleasure. The full number of those who believed were of one heart and soul. Scripture says, one heart, one soul that beats for Jesus. And no one said that any of the things that belonged to him was his own. It sounds almost foreign to a today's society, even amongst the church, but especially society. Today it's what belongs to me is mine, and what belongs to you I'm also working on becoming mine. Here's a few statistics for you. During the pandemic, the richest 1% of the world grew their net wealth by 58%. They shared in on $1.7 trillion, spread mostly between Elon Musk, Jeff Bezos, the Walton family of Walmart, and Bill Gates sharing the largest piece of the pie between them. The end of verse 32 in chapter 4 of Acts. But they had everything in common. Do you feel anything in common with the richest 1% of the world? No? Well, you don't want to. You want to feel alien to their commonality. The richest 1% of the world, I feel gross calling them the richest 1% of the world. Really, they are the 1% with the most accumulated money, which we should know as Christians means nothing. Accumulating even a single dollar of wealth does not add a single droplet to our spiritual tank. Giving money can. Accumulating it can do the opposite. It can dry up our tanks. And I consider accumulating money 
something much different than obtaining money. People can obtain money for the purpose of blessing others, making obtaining money not sinful. Being blessed by God with money and prospering isn't sinful. Accumulating money is the Scrooge McDuck scenario. If you remember DuckTales, is swimming in your money pit as you accumulate wealth for the sole purpose of making more money to expand comfort and pleasure. So I'll close it I'll invite Emmanuel and Zach up. I'll play something pretty as I speak. <laughs> the early church and Acts were given everything that they needed. Not everything that they wanted. How much do we have today that we need, really? And how much is an actual want? We all should know those who know Christ are the richest people on earth. And you don't need a single cent to your name to obtain Him. Now that we had a glimpse into how the early church functioned, remember what Paul says in verse 1. For I want you to know how great a struggle I have for you. We must understand the struggle. Be willing to walk within it. Be willing to endure for the sake of building a people in their faith. Sometimes it means laying in the mud for someone else to step on you so that they can get to the other side clean. And if enough of us lay in the mud, we can get everyone there. The problem is, there are many inside and outside the church who like to step on people in the mud. They enjoy it. Rather than getting in the mud to help others, they will be the ones stepping on you as you're face down in the mud, complaining that you've got mud on their new sneakers. As Jude 1 verse 16 warns, we need to be aware of loud mouth grumblers because a loud mouth grumbler is not willing to self-sacrifice or suffer or struggle for other Christians. And as we see in Paul's second letter to the Corinthians, for as we share abundantly in Christ's sufferings, so through Christ we share abundantly in comfort too. If we are afflicted, it is for your comfort and salvation. And if we are comforted, it is for your comfort which you experience when you patiently endure the same sufferings that we suffer. So whether we suffer or whether we are comforted, it's for the common goal of building others up, which builds up Christ's body. And we all share together being comforted in Christ instead of being comforted in the world. In verse 2, we see Paul struggles. Paul suffers so that hearts may be encouraged. This is an act of love within our struggles. It has true power because of Christ's afflictions. Because He loved us so much, He died on a cross. This love now begins knitting us together. And it will not knit us together in love until there is a struggle for each other's sake. If we only focus on how we feel at church or seek to be entertained and only to receive, what can church do for me today? And we are all just individually attending a church instead of being the church. Which may be disguised to feel like love and oneness at times. But too many people have an inward focused mentality in the church. Man, my church is amazing. Look at everything I get from my church. I get, I take, I receive, I matter. It's my opinion, my theology, my complaints, my ministry, my gifts, my church, my judgment, my nomination, my pastors, my prayers. Give to me what is owed to me. Me, 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 me. And none of this has true power without sacrifice and a willingness to suffer for each other. Feelings are fleeting. Before you know it, that person feels all the feels, says they love their church. When the feelings disappear, we'll be gone on to the next church and search for the next great love. People are in love with a concept. But Jesus is not a concept. His church is not a concept. His love is not a concept. Jesus is real. He's within us. His church is real. He's amongst us. His love is real. It was nailed to a cross. If we focus on serving, giving, and loving our fellow brothers and sisters with a willingness to suffer for them, the body and the gospel, we become united, knitted together as one. Love is pointed outward, not inward. Love without sacrifice is not biblical love. The love we are called to have for one another is not a feeling. Jesus did not simply, only have feelings for us. He sacrificed his human life for us. And Jesus is always our ultimate example in suffering and sacrifice. If you can find peace within a struggle, 
even if you are suffering, nothing can stop you. It may sound like an oxymoron. How can you be at peace within a struggle as we suffer? It's suffering as we deny our passions and desires in the flesh. It's starving our flesh and dismantling the lies. The lies that we need anything outside of Jesus. We don't. Our flesh is always at war with our spirit, but we can find comfort within Christ as Lord. And once you're under the protection of the Lord, you are capable of anything, including enduring suffering. Not just enduring suffering, you grow stronger within suffering. This is truly when you become unstoppable. Life is a lot about context and perspective, right? If you were swimming and you had someone try to ruin your day by splashing a bucket of water on you, it's not going to have much of an effect. You're already in the water. You're already wet. But if you were to splash a bucket of water on a bride on her wedding day and she's about to go down the aisle, that will ruin her day. Probably her whole life. Context and perspective. Have some perspective. When the devil tries to serve us up his own brand of suffering, when the threat of suffering is used by him to try to prevent us from serving others of the body, let him see our willingness to struggle for our brothers and sisters in Christ. Let him see our willingness to suffer and struggle for the gospel, sacrificing so that it can be proclaimed. Let him see us knitted together in love as the church body through self-sacrifice. This will terrify the devil because all the devil has is his ability to highlight your struggles, to make you reject your struggles, make you hate your struggles. But if you show the devil that you rejoice in your struggles, you reduce him to nothing. Then the devil will come face to face with the anointing power of the Spirit, the Spirit which holds back enemies from even touching a hair on the one who is anointed. He comes face to face with the same spirit which anointed Jesus. The same Jesus who the devil will see at the end of days when he has completely destroyed the body of Armageddon. And that is the spirit we all serve. Are you willing to serve Jesus? Are you ready to serve Jesus? Are you rooted up and built up in Jesus so that you can serve him well? Are you willing to toil for Jesus? Are you willing to suffer for Jesus? How great is your struggle? Flip the page back to chapter 1 of Colossians. For this I toil, struggling with all his energy, that he powerfully works within me. Are you toiling? Are you struggling? Ask yourself, what is the state of my energy? Because the Bible says here that toiling and struggling comes with all Jesus' energy, and he powerfully works within us. Is Jesus powerfully working within you? Or is something else powerfully working within you? We do not want to give anything else in our lives power outside of Jesus. We are meant to be indwelled by the power that comes from Jesus. Are we meant to be as kittens or are we meant to be as lions? Are we meant to be as toy soldiers or are we meant to be as equipped soldiers? Are we meant to be reduced to ashes or are we meant to be as conquerors? Are you marked by your struggle? How great is your struggle? Heavenly Father, I pray. I pray today that whatever anyone is struggling with today, God, that you empower them within this to be able to rejoice in the struggle, to show people their struggles and how they're able to conquer it and able to feel it and not ignore the feelings of the struggle, but also just be able to use that as a light to the rest of the world. And thank you, Jesus. Thank you so much, Jesus, for your spirit. Thank you, Father, for sending Jesus. Thank you, God. I pray this in the Lord. In Jesus' name, amen.